How wonderful to be with a whole crowd of people who are willing to do nothing for the next hour or so, but sit and listen and breathe. You're not getting paid for this after all. You can't put it on your resume and there won't be a test afterward. I'm not even sure it will make you a better person, which makes you both wonderful and rare. In the midst of a ridiculously busy day, you have somehow decided to pull out of the traffic for a while and park yourself here, where you don't have to prove a thing. How in the world did you become so free? Almost everyone I know is bone tired, not just the corporate attorneys, but also the middle, middle school teachers and the fifth graders, the college students, the pastors, the parents, the bank tellers, and the bank presidents. Even my 80-year-old mother is tired, partly because she stays up too late every night watching Jay Leno, and until last week, Conan O'Brien, but also because the world presses in on her. Ever since she learned to use a computer after my father's death, she not only knows about everything bad that is happening everywhere in the world, but she also keeps up with a wide variety of causes, doing her bit to make a difference in the world by casting her vote, and writing her congresspeople, and making her donation. She also keeps up with her children, her grandchildren, her one living cousin, her friends on WidowNet, her neighbors, her doctors, her prescriptions, her pansies, her front porch clay pot vegetable garden, and the wide world of birds who count on her to keep the feeders that dangle outside all of her windows filled. She fell down in the ivy a couple of weeks ago and bruised her hip, but I'm happy to say she's back up again and busy as ever. When I ask her when she's going to slow down, she says, eh, maybe next year. Then she reminds me that she is the mother and I am a fine one to talk because she knows that downtime is as elusive for me as it is for her. I looked everywhere for it in preparation for being with you today. I googled it, which is how I learned that downtime is a death thrash metal band from Germany. <laughs> I also found quite a few sites offering me ways to fill my downtime with drumming groups and poetry jams and drop-in tutoring. I looked on Wikipedia where I found this. The term downtime is used to refer to periods when a system is unavailable. Downtime or outage duration refers to the period of time that a system fails to provide or perform its primary function. I looked on Amazon.com where I found one book by Mark Iaconelli called Downtime, Helping Teenagers to Pray. I put that on my wish list. The second book was Downtime, A Guide to Federal Incarceration by David Novak. <laughs> that was all I found under my keyword, but with a little more effort, I found Time Off, The Upside to Downtime, which includes a primer on filling out in unemployment forms and getting past unemployment guilt. You see the problem. In our culture, at least, downtime is lost time, wasted time, missed Un underemployed time, which is to say unproductive time and therefore worthless time, at least according to the economic standards by which our culture measures success and failure. No one is calling it sacred. No one is suggesting that the lack of it is eating away at our relationships, our creativity, our health, our focus, our souls. The last time I took my college students on a field trip, the man at the wheel of the Piedmont College bus told me that he's a retired policeman from New York City who had hoped to kick back in the beautiful northeast Georgia mountains where we both live with his wife of 37 years, but then his retirement fund tanked. So now he works three different jobs to make ends meet. When I tried to feel sorry for him, he said, eh, I'm used to it. I've worked two jobs all my life. He's not unusual. By the 1990s, the average American worker was putting in 164 extra hours of paid labor each year, the equivalent of an extra month of work. Around this same time, the two-income family became the middle-class norm, which meant that the new pressure at work was matched by new pressures at home. 
The incline in work time was matched by a steep decline in the unpaid activities on which most societies depend, which include the care of the very old and the very young, civic duties, volunteer work, religious work, and support of the arts. While those who still bowled, bowled alone, Hallmark developed a new line of cards for absent parents. I found them at Target one day when I was looking for a birthday card. One said, sorry, I can't be here to tuck you in. Another one said, sorry, I can't say good morning. Those cards made me so sad that I had to just stand there in front of the card rack with my head down for a minute, imagining single moms and dads heading out to their beat up cars in the dark to work the graveyard shift at Walmart so their kids could go to the doctor or the dentist when they needed to. Of course, I also know moms and dads who head out to their leased Land Rovers before dawn to squeeze in a few more billable hours so the whole family can stay a couple more days on their annual ski vacation at Vail. So money's not the only robber of downtime. I know insanely busy college students whose busyness does not earn them a dime. When they aren't on their cell phones, they're on their computers, and when they aren't on their computers, they're on their MP3 players, and when they aren't on their MP3 players, they're in their car on the way to the mall, checking their cell phones for messages with one hand while they drive with the other. On the premise that most people don't risk their lives for meaningless things, I asked some of these students to tell me about their cell phone use. Why did they spend so much time focused on those tiny screens? One said, I don't have to walk five miles to talk to someone I care about. When one of us needs emotional support, we're there for each other. Another one said, my parents text me. If I don't text them right back, they panic. My cell phone is their safety net. Another one said, without a cell phone, you'd never know what was going on except in your own little world. I was glad I asked, since these all struck me really as pretty good answers. A fourth student volunteered that he thought it had something to do with instant gratification. His generation wasn't used to waiting for things, he said. If they wanted something, they wanted it now, because five minutes from now, they would be on to the next thing, and they would no longer remember or care what the last thing was. ADD, anyone? So technology is another robber of downtime for reasons that only our counselors know for sure. Do we spend so much time with these toys because they increase our sense of connection with other people or because we're so terribly afraid of being alone? Are we hooked on the glittering images because they take us beyond our small worlds or because we've lost the ability to imagine other worlds on our own? Do we love Google because it leads us straight to the information we need or because we cannot spare the time to read books anymore? I don't think these are multiple choice questions. I think the answer to all of them is yes. I still buy books, too many of them really. But more and more, I use Google to find what I need. The problem is that Google only leads me to a sentence or a statistic or a confirmation of fact. Back when I read whole books to find these things, I found other things I was not looking for that led me in directions more wonderful than the ones I started out with. And movies, oh, I love movies. Slumdog Millionaire, The English Patient, I Heart Huckabees. Films like these offer me so much more than glittering images. They take me places in the world I'll never go. They let me inside the minds of people that I will never be. The problem is that while I'm inside those other minds, in those other worlds, I am not in my own. I'm sitting in a dark room in a double wide armchair when I could be sitting on the porch finding Cassiopeia in the sky or trying to hear the difference between the song of a spring peeper and a southern leopard frog. Now granted, I might not be able to find as many people interested in talking about frog sounds as about the ending of Slumdog, but who knows what might happen in my own mind, on my own porch, if I were to go there more often instead of hitching a ride on someone else's mind. Don't let me forget my cell phone. I waited a long time to get one. Since being available to anyone who wanted to call me anywhere, any time of the day didn't sound like a plus to me. 
But when I finally wearied of looking for pay phones or standing in the rain while I talked on one, I got a nice little Motorola, which turns out to be as addictive as smart food popcorn. Why daydream when I could be talking on my cell phone? Why concentrate on staying in my lane on the expressway when I could be returning phone calls? <laughs> I mean, I know all the dangers of pecking out a number on my cell while I steer clear of a tractor trailer with my other, and I still do it. Will someone arrest me, please? <laughs> still, my cell phone helps me feel so much closer to the people on my speed dial list that I honest to goodness feel their absence more keenly than I did when I couldn't summon their voices at will. There are even some people whose messages I save so I can listen to them over and over again. This is not something I do on the highway so much as it is something I do on those dark nights when God is just not picking up. Here then is a third thief of downtime. Not all the things that militate against stopping, but the deep human fear of what might happen or what might not happen if the chirping of all those electronics really stopped for a while, if the room really did get quiet enough for me to hear my own heartbeat and more than beat to cry out for what it so badly needs from me that it so rarely gets. Almost everyone I know can make a list of the things they know give them life that they never do. They can also make a list of the reasons why they never get around to doing these things. If you want one simple thing you can do when you get home, then just make these two lists yourself on the same sheet of paper. On one side, things I know give me life, and on the other side, reasons why I don't do them. Then just keep that list handy where you can find it when you feel like there's a hollow place in the middle of your chest where your heart used to be. When you can feel a cold breeze blowing right through you, pull out your list and look at it. And never stop wondering when you lost your freedom to do the things that you know give you life. As ironic as it sounds, you don't need to exercise any choice at all to be busy in a world like ours. You just wake up in the morning and step into the torrent, which will sweep you along until it washes you up on the shore at night, surrounded by empty plastic water bottles, the wrapper of the power bar you ate for lunch, and your crumpled list of things to do. This takes no effort at all, except maybe the effort to keep going without getting sick. What takes enormous effort in a world like ours is choosing when to be busy and when not. That takes huge willpower. And I don't know anyone who can pull it off alone for very long, both because the whole culture militates against it and because the human psyche digs in its heels as well. One of the regular assignments in my world religions class is to do nothing for three 20-minute periods and then write about it. I asked students to do this during the first half of the semester when we're studying the religions of the East both because I want them to get it that religion is about practices at least as much as it's about beliefs, and also because I want them to get a firsthand taste of why the religions of the East so value the art of meditation. I always assure them they don't have to become Buddhists to do this exercise. They may, but they don't have to. All they have to do is sit in a quiet place alone and focus their attention on being exactly where they are, not in the past, thinking about what they did last hour, nor in the future, thinking about what they will do the next hour, but being in the present with nothing to do but sit there and notice what their minds are doing with this assignment until their 20 minutes are up, then rinse and repeat two times. <laughs> Who are you, I ask them, when you're not doing anything? When you shut off all your usual distractions, who do you discover? in the quiet clearing at the center of all that noise. I give two options for students who are sure their heads will explode if they sit still that long. I say, you may also go for a walk alone or you may eat a meal alone, but in either case, give your full attention to what you're doing, then write me a three-page paper on what your mind did with this assignment. Reading these papers is my favorite part of the semester because the writing is so fresh it leaps off the page. 
One student wrote that he would never, under any circumstances, eat a Whopper ever again. <laughs> that up until this exercise, that had been his absolute favorite meal, but once he chewed every bite 20 times, he realized what a greasy, gristly mess he was taking inside himself. Another student took the walking option. This is what she wrote. I've lived where I've lived for most of my life. I've walked in my backyard a hundred times without ever noticing what kind of trees I was walking under. Now, for the first time in my life, I can say with absolute confidence that the trees in my backyard are not pines, nor oaks, but poplars. Deer hunters turn out to be naturals at this exercise, at least if they're not the kind who haul cases of beer up into their deer blinds with them. The sober ones, they know how to sit still for hours at a time, paying exquisite attention to the slightest movement at the corners of their vision, paying attention to the first sound of something rustling in the dried leaves. They know how to be alone. They don't mind their own company. When I told one of them he could do this class assignment in a deer blind, he wrote that the main difference was that he'd never really thought of what he was doing up there as any kind of spiritual exercise. Maybe that was what made this time different, he wrote, but this really weird thing happened that has never happened to me before. While I was sitting up there, you know, just paying attention to paying attention, it was all of a sudden like I was part of everything around me. I just kind of became part of the tree I was sitting in. I wasn't in the woods. I was the woods. I know that sounds crazy, but that's what happened. It didn't last long, but it was cool. Not everyone has a positive experience. Plenty of students write about falling asleep or looking at the clock every 30 seconds or finding out what busy monkeys their minds really are. The saddest report I've read to date came from a boy who was entirely mute in class. I never knew what was going on in his mind until I read his report, just one page long, not three. He could not do the exercise, he said. Every time he tried, it got to where he couldn't breathe. You asked me who we are when we are not doing anything, he wrote, and my answer is, I am no one. I am no one at all. As sad as it was, his answer, I think, was not all that unusual. I think anyone who winds up at a clearing in the busyness of life, whether by necessity, class assignment, or choice, discovers what a sobering place it can be. To use the Wikipedia definition, that clearing is a place where your normal operating system can become unavailable to you. It's a place where your customary way of doing things can crash so that you fail to provide or perform your primary function, which gives you the rare opportunity to rethink what your primary function is. Is it to make A's? Is it to make lots of money? Is it to fulfill everyone's expectations of you, to rise to the top of your profession, to finish your to-do list? What are you doing here? Since I harbor a secret desire to take over the writer's almanac when Garrison Keillor retires, <laughs> here is my poem for the day by Mary Oliver. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean, the one who has flung herself out of the grass, the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. The Summer Day by Mary Oliver. 
Once you decide to spend some time kneeling down in the grass to pay attention to that grasshopper, then sooner or later you are bound to discover the difference between downtime and the sacred art of stopping, which is something like the difference between a mall and a sanctuary. There's still plenty to do at a mall. When you spend your downtime there, all you're really doing is swapping one kind of busyness for another with all the same distraction, noise, and hustle. If, on the other hand, you know a place you might be willing to call a sanctuary, whether it's at the foot of a waterfall, in a carol, at the library, a corner of your own bedroom, or in a house of worship like this, then you also know why stopping there might qualify as sacred. Where else are you going to hold still long enough to hear your own heart beat? Not because you're hooked up to a heart monitor in an emergency room wondering if you'll make it or not, but because you decided to stop earlier than that, when there was still time to entertain fresh answers to the questions of who you are and why you're here. Sanctuaries are good places to listen for those answers whether they come from outside of you or inside of you, sometimes, like my deer hunter, you can lose track of which is which, at least if you're willing to stop long enough to get that lucky. Like I said earlier, this can be hard, hard to do all by yourself in a culture that thinks downtime is a death thrash metal band from Germany or a Friday night at the Cineplex. Plus, you have your own fear of the silent dark to deal with. But there are communities of people who practice the sacred art of stopping on a regular basis, and they're worth getting to know if you decide you want to do more stopping too. Some of them are Zen monks, and some of them are bird watchers. Plenty of them are Presbyterians. <laughs> and some of them are volunteers for hospice who stay up all night long just sitting by a bed and holding a hand. Last Friday night, I took a bunch of students to the Reform Temple in Atlanta for the weekly Shabbat service. Most of them had never been in a synagogue before. They got three extra credit points for going, so I wouldn't exactly call them seekers. <laughs> but once they got there, most of them melted, just like I did. Our busy week was finally over. We had nothing to do but sit there for the next hour at least listening to people sing and pray and following along in the new prayer book where we could. We arrived 10 minutes early, which gave us a chance to notice the other people who came in after us, a blonde woman who was leading a much older woman with red hair in to find a seat, an African-American woman herding her kids, two women in beautiful kippahs and prayer shawls who turned out to be the cantor and the associate rabbi, and a really tall guy who turned out to be the rabbi. Even after the service began, other people continued to arrive, looking as if they had just fought their ways across the last 12 yards of desert to fall into a shady oasis. When we finally came to that point in the service where you turn to the door and welcome the Sabbath, one last guy was coming through with his head down, trying not to call attention to himself. His forehead was all mashed down into this one big worry line. Then he looked up and saw all of us looking at him, he realized what was happening, and he opened his arms to us with this great big smile on his face, and we all said, Shabbat Shalom, the peace of the Sabbath. Other communities call it by other names, meditation, centering prayer, salat, but the wisdom is the same. When it comes to stopping, we all need some help finding our ways to the clearing. We need regular practices that will help us rest there on a regular basis so that we are not washed up on the same shore every night with the empty litter of our days. We need people who can remind us what our primary function is so that we don't fall for our own or anyone else's equation of downtime with system failure. I say need, but what I mean is want. If it is life we want, not only for ourselves, but for those who share this life with us, then we will learn the sacred art of stopping any way we can. For it is there, in that clearing, that both the grasshopper and the one who made her are found. Thank you.
Thank you, Barbara Brown Taylor. You are listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, originating from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. I'm Tim Hart Anderson, Senior Minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church and moderator of the forum. Our speaker today is Barbara Brown Taylor, author of the new book, An Altar in the World, The Geography of Faith. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience at Westminster, I'd like to thank the listening audience for their support of the forum and invite them to join us on March 19th for a presentation by, by Tom Jelton, national security correspondent for NPR. He will be speaking on global hotspots. Where will the 3 a.m. phone call come from? Details available at eWestminster.org. The spring series of the forum is dedicated in memory of Dr. Donald Morrison Meisel, pastor of Westminster Church from 1972 to 1992 and one of the founders of the Town Hall Forum. Don was the voice of the forum and a marvelous voice it was for more than 12 years. And now Barbara Brown Taylor, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. First one has to do with the geography of what you've been speaking about. Have you been describing a uniquely American phenomenon, or do you think elsewhere in the world is, there's a the crying need for silence and stopping? I think it is, I mean, what can I say? I live here. This is the phenomenon I know best. What I notice when I travel other places is there are cultures that sanction siesta, uh, closing shops for periods of time, whether that's lunchtime or early in the afternoon or half a day on Wednesday. I also notice as I travel, though, that um, American culture has made its way around the world and that there are very few places to go that don't recognize this as either the way to get ahead, the way to make money, or the way to have what you want in life. So that's why I'm spending time pushing in the opposite direction. And then a question following up on that about the socioeconomic stratification of this need. Is this a middle class or an upper income phenomenon? Or people of color, ethnic folks, uh, immigrants here in America, lower income people encountering the same needs? What I notice in talking about this is the way it makes those differences um, clearer than before because there are people on the lower end of the ladder who can't afford to say no, for whom working two or three jobs at minimum wage is a necessity. What that brings out for me is that there are also justice issues involved in stopping, at least if we want life not only for ourselves but for those who share this life with us. So that it calls me in particular to think of ways in which I, as someone privileged to say no and stop from time to time, um, might both myself and with a lot of other people stand up for um, people who don't have that, not luxury, that necessity of life in the same way I would stand up for people who don't have food or shelter or clothes. So it calls me into some social activism as well as um, contemplative space. What inspires you to keep writing? They actually say what drives you to keep writing, but I assume you're not, you're not driven to do this because uh, that would be ag against what you just said. I think I'm a driven person and I think it shows. Those who can't teach, perhaps. I, I write because I have been the beneficiary of words that have changed my life, of uh, words early on that gave me places to go and where I lived was not a great place to be. And while I've said a few things about the dangers of that, that is also one of the great, great gifts of words, whether they're spoken or read, um, is the ability to transcend my world and meet people in, in theirs and come back to my own with a fresh eye. So I want to be part of that however I can. Personal question about your own practice of downtime. How do you practice it? I actually do. It's the only thing I do right, I think. Is uh, I, I finally, after retiring from 15 years in parish ministry, uh, realized how difficult Sunday was and would always be, so I, I picked um, Saturday. Um, all of Judaism had preceded me in that choice <laughs> uh, and had also proven to me that no matter how busy or how poor or how many children or how many aging parents I had, that there were people all over the world who were stopping for 25 hours um, every single week. And I thought if they could do it, I could do it. Um, I've been at that for 11 years now, and I find that even when I'm failing at that practice, it um, is an A-plus practice because even the 
inability to stop or the troubles I have or the things my mind does to me are full of uh, learning that I need to have. So a Sabbath practice that I've engaged at the level of one day a week. There's a commandment about that somewhere. I'll have to look at it sometime. Okay. Uh, you mentioned leaving the parish ministry. You wrote a book about that called Leaving Church. Why did you write the book Leaving Church? I wish I hadn't titled it that now because uh, it, it actually it carried a kind of pun for me because when I left parish ministry for college teaching, I got lots of sympathy notes from people who said they were sorry to hear I was leaving the ministry or they were sorry to hear I had left church. And I went into a really sorry three-month period of thinking that was so, and I wrote my way out with that book. Um, if you hear that title, it should immediately call into question what your definition of church is. And whether that is an identified community of believers who meet at a certain address, it's certainly that. But could it also be the community of seekers whose names might be known to God alone? I, I at least stretched my definition in the re writing of that book and dug myself out of a hole as well. What frustrates you most about the church and what is the best way to address that frustration? Oh, what frustrates me most about the church is it's full of human beings. And as long as I can stay focused on them, I don't have to stay focused on how I'm one of them, causing at least, if not more, problems than anyone else. So um, truly, that, that's a straight answer. Any, any institution that calls on people to come together to make something happen or to be together or to support one another or to, to help a vision come true are going to run into each other. And I think that, like the practice of Sabbath, uh, however that exercise strikes you, it is one of the richest exercises on earth to try to do something with other people, uh, many of whom you did not choose and would never choose for company, but in whose presence you find unexpected, unsought-for blessings. What can the church learn about these practices you've described from other religions? You've mentioned Judaism. Are there... Other practices that might be helpful for us as if those of us in the church to learn from? I really have had to go visiting. Uh, I don't know whether it's the Protestant work ethic or American culture at large, but I have had to visit other religious traditions in order to find these disciplines of stopping because I no longer find them in my own tradition. Um, in, in my own, I'm an Episcopalian, but in my own tradition, I can go on retreat I can engage a contemplative prayer practice. I'm often on my own doing that, however. Even um, people in Christian churches I know who practice Sabbath will often tell me it's on a Tuesday or it's half a day on Wednesday, which is terrific except that you're doing it all alone. So I've had to go visiting um, literally to masjids where uh, five times daily prayer is taught as a way of stepping back from whatever's going on to be in the presence of the sacred. I've attended Shabbat services. I have visited um, Hindu and Buddhist teaching centers that call for minimum an hour a day of, of quiet. I don't find those teachings in my own tradition right now, and that's a point of sadness. What about the Bible? Are, are there ancient practices described there or rituals or covenants or commandments that, uh, w that feed us in terms of our need for understanding what downtime might be today? Yes, not only the aforementioned commandment, but also wilderness times, which strike me as stopping times. At least biblically speaking, God does some of God's best work in the wilderness when people's customary ways of coping have broken down, when their regular systems are not functioning. And whether that is Elijah in a cave or the people of Israel in the wilderness or Jesus in, in his own wilderness, those are times when God gets busy with people. So those are the sorts of stories I call on. And Mary sitting at the feet of her teacher while Martha bangs pots around in the kitchen. God bless her because neither Mary nor Jesus would eat if she weren't doing that. Speaking of being in the wilderness, someone asks about uh, dealing with the loss of a loved one. Could you speak briefly of, of the sacred art of stopping and facilitating grief and the process of grief and a grief support group? That's a wonderful question. It's a wonderful question, and I, I go at that one the way I go toward many things that are considered bad or sad or to be avoided. Um, grief is a predictable stopping time for many of us. 
Um, before my own father died, I had a good friend who lost her father, and she was an eldest daughter like me, had as much intimacy in that relationship as I did. And she wrote me an astonishing note afterwards. She said, it's now been a month since he died. Most of what needed to happen has happened. And I find myself, she said, strangely sad that that is over because through the period of his last illness, his death in this last month, I have not doubted for a single minute that I was doing the one thing necessary, that I was exactly where I needed to be, doing exactly what I needed to be doing, and now I'm about to step in to the busyness of life again. My time is up. Uh, when my own father died, I found that I, uh, I held on to that like a lifeline, and I found it to be true. I don't suggest that every one of you finds it to be true, but I did. That there was a, a sanctity to that time, a sacredness to that time, in which I was focused, in which my mind did not wander, in which I did not forget things, because I was doing the one thing necessary for me to do. So grief offered me that opportunity, and it has left me less afraid to encounter new grieving times in my life, whether that's the loss of a loved one or a job or a relationship or uh, an economic status. I'm ready to head into it and see what's there. Can you say anything about the connection between a spiritual downtime and a physical activity? I can say something about that. I named this book An Altar in the World because I wanted to go after what I think are false distinctions between sacred, secular, church, world, body, spirit. You can name them, can't you? Most of them. And I, I, by listening, Zen monks, bird watchers, hospice volunteers, and Presbyterians, I meant to um, go after that a bit. And I, I suppose I have enough trust in the practice of stopping that whatever door you open into that, you'll end up where you need to be. So I don't have too many requirements about which door you open as long as you can hear the sound of your own heartbeat and as long as you know that there's a different possibility on the other side of that door that you're willing to walk through it to discover. I must say I appreciate your frequent references to Presbyterians, but <laughs> most of our audience probably are Lutherans. <laughs> Right? They, and they, they need downtime too. <laughs> more. They need more. Does, it, does a commitment to downtime, to this pursuit of quiet and contemplative space, make one better or healthier or happier? Better and worse might be another of those dualisms I don't want to engage. It, it will deepen one. How about that? To engage the sacred art of stopping, I guarantee you, will deepen you. It will deepen your ability to see, to hear, to feel, sometimes to feel things you would just as soon not feel, which is why you were so busy. Uh, I also have students who write in these papers I talked about that they found themselves weeping for 30 minutes straight without having the least idea what that was about. And when they took some time to think about it, it was accumulated sadness that often graduated into accumulated gratitude that had had no, no place to find its way to expression either. So avoiding categories like better and worse, I will um, go for wiser. You will be wiser. Isn't downtime really just a fancy way of describing being lazy? <laughs> you know, that was actually um, a Roman emperor's excuse for challenging the people of Israel about the observance of Sabbath. That's always, it, I think John Calvin had some things to say about that too. I think that has often been the critique of people who are um, sold on the more is better economy. The more of everything is better and slow and not much is not good, which incidentally uh, disenfranchises people in our culture who for multiple reasons, whether it is disability or age um, or incarceration, since I found that on Amazon, who, who get X'd out of a culture that only values what can be produced. So I resist that. And what's wrong with being lazy anyhow? Uh, <laughs> since, since, you, since you raised John Calvin, let me ask this next question. Any tips on how not to feel guilty about <laughs> downtime? 
I was actually up to that in titling this talk. I, I thought that if I could call it sacred, people might think they could do it without feeling guilty. But if a commandment didn't take care of that, I really don't know what I can do. What does it say about the one who made the grasshopper that we can only discover this maker when we are in downtime? Oh, I don't think, did I say that? I don't think that, um, but I am a big fan of activity and withdrawal from activity. Uh, it's actually the pattern of Sabbath. Six days on, one day off. And the one day off does not discredit the six days on. It blesses the six days on. And the six days at work bless the day off. So that what I am interested in recovering is a rhythm that is something other than the culture's rhythm of drivenness and collapse, exertion, exhaustion. I think to recover any kind of sacred rhythm uh, will teach me that both in my encounter, my busy encounters with other people, and in with the time that I withdraw to let those encounters sink in and um, be deepened and be made more wise about what they mean enables me to go out and be busy again in more fruitful ways. Often when students engage this practice because they're assigned to, um, they'll tell me they're more productive after a day off, and that's their biggest surprise. They are more productive after a day off. I also notice, since I may not get a question, that in today's paper, the Italian Roman Catholic bishops have called upon people to, to give up technology for Lent, to put away their iPods and their email. This will never happen. Mary Oliver is one of my favorite poets. I've read most of her books. Can you recommend other poets that you enjoy? Why don't I have an answer to that question when I am asked it? I read so many poets so widely. I'm currently enjoying Scott Cairns, uh, who has taken some of the early, earliest Christian writers and, and rendered their poetry um, readable to me in my century. Coleman Barks, who teaches just 45 miles away from me, or did at the University of Georgia, is a translator of Rumi, Jalaladin Rumi whose book of collected poetry was uh, several years ago the best-selling book of poetry in America. I always like to recommend books of poetry that are accessible because so many people think they don't like poetry until they start reading. Billy Collins, what an easy way into poetry. Um, and, and like those other doors I mentioned, I think you, you pick any door and go through and see where it leads. So those are some other names. Good. What advice would you give to a pastor in her first two years? Oh. If I knew, would I be here? I don't know. I, I do know that everything I've talked about is, is, cannot ever be up to an individual to change. It, it simply cannot happen. I think that, that the permission to stop, whether it's called sacred or anything else, comes from a culture. Now, it can be a small culture. It can be a church culture. I, I was just at a college yesterday that is very interested in creating a culture in which highly motivated young women um, don't spend a lot of their time in tears because they're so burned out. Um, it's why I point people towards some um, community that knows how to stop. What would my advice be to a young pastor? Uh, don't take the job unless there are some people who will put in writing that they will give you time to access the resources you need to do your job. Get it in writing uh, that, that you will not participate in the illusion of omnicompetence that you can do all things well at all times on no sleep and no downtime. I think that the uh, perpetuation of that illusion comes from every side of the equation and it's by no means limited to pastors. It's as active in my attorney sister or my friend who's a nurse in the emergency room as it is anywhere else. But the problem is when emotionally demanding work like that deprives us of the resources we need to do the work. And I think the more we could honor one another's need to go wade in a spring of fresh water from time to time or to watch a grasshopper. We don't give that permission often. It would be lovely if we gave it more often. Is one of our audience members who begins by saying, you're fab, love your writing. Yeah. Now that we've stroked your ego, here comes the question. Oh. If, if religion is as much about practices as beliefs, 
what are some other spiritual practices we can do to inform our faith besides doing nothing for 20 minutes? <laughs> Read my book. <laughs> it is truly. It was the premise of the whole book. Uh, I, you know, again, I'm in a church that's in some conflict right now, and what occurs to me is that all the great traditions of the world, including all the great Christian traditions of the world, have things we have been taught to do when we don't know what to think and when we don't know what to say and when we don't know what to believe. Um, again, I know mine best, and mine says things like, when you don't know what to think or believe or say, wash some feet. When you don't know what to think or believe or say, find someone who needs shelter or needs clothing. When you don't know what to think or believe or say, sit down around a table and share some food and hand it to one another. Building on those teachings, I sat down to write a book with at least 12 practices that I thought would not give in to any sacred secular divide, but would answer that question for any kind of seeker. So there are chapters like the practice of getting lost, the practice of being present to God, the practice of feeling pain, practice of saying blessings, the practice of walking the earth. These are the titles. So I've tried to answer that question at some length, and I think it's a, an important question right now when plenty of people of faith don't know what to think or say or believe. There's still things we can do. Must have been your publicist who set you up for that question. That was very good. Uh, in your opinion, will the current downturn enable us to appreciate downtime or to find less expensive ways to keep busy? I don't think it will. I think it is already. I'm an NPR listener, and I just heard yesterday about, what is it called, laid off camps, where people who are laid off are going and, and saying things like, this is the first time I've rested in 20 years, or this is really terrible and I'm a little worried about food, but right now I'm going to the movies. Or people who say things like, I, I mean, dire things, lost my house, ended up moving into a much smaller space with my children, ended up, much to my chagrin, accepting groceries and leftovers, some of them without labels from local supermarkets. And lo and behold, we have all bought used bicycles, and we love riding bicycles, and some of those cans have things we've never tried before. We have surprise nights. We found out we like hearts of palm. <laughs> um, I know people who have planted gardens for the first time in their lives. I in no, no way mean to discount the very dire circumstances, but I'm the daughter of a mother who lived through both the Great Depression and World War II, and she said, very few people will die from this, but many people will learn to live on less. And she said, you know, we got into the when I was a child, you know, we used to peel the aluminum foil off our gum wrappers and roll it into balls when I was a child. But um, she gave me courage. She gave me courage. She's a veteran of, of two periods of extreme economic downturn. And it's, it's one more of those things in which I'm willing not only to look for the life, but try to be part of increasing the life for other people who are in more dire straits than I am. One last question has to do with young people. What do you say to young people as you watch them with their technological devices and their obsession with communication and being always available? What do you say to them about downtime? Well, first of all, I tell them stories designed to scare them, but most of all I just say things like, here is a basket. If I see you turn your cell phone, I am taking it away from you and I'm putting it in this basket and I'll decide whether you ever get it back or not. <laughs> the nice thing about being a teacher is you can threaten and you give grades, so it's a <laughs> wonderful situation. Thank you. <laughs>